make sure you guys get outside of the comfort zone and become relevant. And sadly, architecture has become irrelevant. Business of Architecture, episode 224. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. As a podcast listener, get free instant access to my four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architecture and design professionals. Get rid of the post-it notes and Excel spreadsheets and get real-time insights on the profitability of your firm with a simple, beautiful, and easy-to-customize graphical dashboard. Say goodbye to undercharging or ending the year wondering where all that profit went. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm. Learn more and get a free trial over at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Today is the second half of my interview with the entrepreneur, educator, and architect Ricardo Alvarez Diaz. Alvarez Diaz is the founding principal of Alvarez Diaz and Villalon, an award-winning architecture and interior design practice with offices in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and Miami, Florida. Alvarez Diaz is president of the Puerto Rico Builders Association. He serves as the founding co-chair of the local Urban Land Institute, the ULI District Council, and he's on the board of directors of Invest Puerto Rico, a nonprofit organization established in 2017 to promote the island's economic development. He also teaches a course on entrepreneurship at the School of Architecture, Polytechnic University of Puerto Rico, and frequently writes on the topics of leadership, sustainability, and business. With his wife and business partner, Cristina Villalon, he co-sponsors the Alvarez Diaz and Villalon Fund at the University of Notre Dame, of which he is a graduate. Now, if you listen between the lines of today's episode, you'll be able to hear how Alvarez Diaz has built up a successful practice. He talks about why which clients you work for is extremely important and how to recognize which clients are the right clients and which ones aren't. He also reveals why he feels that the traditional business model of architecture is dying or already dead. Here's today's show. You mentioned one of the one of your ahas was being decisive. Yes. Right? Being able to take action. And, you know, I, I like the when you look at the original word of decisive, it goes back to the Latin root that means to cut. So you're cutting off an opportunity, which sort of like we say yes to something, you say no to something else. Can you think of an experience that you've had where you've had to be decisive or it was difficult for you to make that decision? Um, but not knowing the future, you took decisive action and looking back, you can say, oh, either that was the right decision or the wrong decision. Well, I, I think that I can tell you a, a positive story that I made the right decision. And I also want to tell you one that I actually made the wrong decision. Both. Um, I made the, uh, I had a, a, a big client that we were hired to do three hotels for them. So again, this is a big client. Uh, and then he calls me one day and says, hey, listen, I want you to design my, uh, my, a new apartment that we bought. And I also bought a house in the woods. And I want you also to actually do the design for, for us. Um, I knew right away that it wasn't, that we had to say no. Because if I say yes to him, I, I would put myself in a, in a position which I have not been with him before which when you work large, pro large projects, a lot of those projects are not that emotional. You know, you have a clear idea, you have a, a program, you have a certain amount of time to actually design it, and it has to be open quickly. But when you do residential work, it is very emotional. And I was very concerned that if I, if I actually get into that, I would, I would damage the professional relationship I had with him just because decisions are not rational anymore. They, they come out of a place of emotion. So it was a very hard decision to tell someone that you were doing maybe 20% of the firm's invoicing for that year. No, we can't do your apartment. No, we can't do your uh, cottage. So that was, a, that was a difficult decision. But of course, the way I, di I did it is that I brought an architect that I knew very talented, and I would claim that a lot more talented than us in, in those projects. Uh, and we, and I, made him, I made it easy for him. I said, listen, this is a wonderful architect. I believe that she knows your wife, and I think that you are in good hands. Uh, I don't want to lose focus from the three projects that you uh, awarded to us. And 
And I want to make sure that we don't fail in everything because when you want to be everything to everyone, that's when you start failing. So uh, that was hard. I have to tell you, it wasn't easy and it was the right decision. I'm very happy we're able to do that. And how, how did the client respond to that? What was... Well, at the beginning, you have to understand people, this is emotional, so they get a little hurt. Uh, but I, I, the way I presented it, like I, like I said, I said, this is the best decision for you because if not, I might fail on your other projects that are a lot bigger. So he, he understood the fact that I had a solution for him made, him made it a lot easy. And on that first meeting with the other architect, with him and his, uh, uh, and his partner, I was in that meeting. I said, don't worry, I'll be in the first one. So uh, to make sure that if for some reason there's no chemistry and it doesn't work, I'll find you the right answer. So that's how I was able to help uh, that process. But, he, you know, I don't think he took it at first like, awesome. I, I'm, I'm sure he felt like, whoa, I'm giving this person a lot of work and now I'm not good enough. So you have to be very careful and very, um, uh, I would say, uh, I, you know, Ah, the word is, you know, you have to be empathetic because you have to, you, 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 uh, you know, in life, decisions you make today might affect you in the future. That's why I go back to the comment I said to you before about being careful with the arrogance that comes with our profession and bringing down a notch because, um, if, you know, a true leader is someone that's there to actually focus and help and not to be a protagonist. So in this way, I was able to manage it well. On the other hand, I have to tell you a terrible decision that I made, which was uh, maybe six years ago. Uh, we were trying to get away from residential work because residential work, even though we do maybe one or two houses a year, they're very specific. And we only take one or maybe two. And we tell the clients, if you want us to do this, either you wait or you have to find another architect. As simple as that. Um, uh, but this uh, client kept uh, calling and, and, and asking and, and saying, you listen, I, I want you to do it. And of course, that whole ego thing, like you're the only one I want. And then you start getting confused, like, oh, my God, I'm so talented that they're actually fighting for me. And, and you know, and I said, well, if you're willing to wait six months, I mean, she's like, oh, I will wait six months. No problem. I told the world. And and. But I knew I should have said no from the beginning because after those six months, I wasn't ready to actually do the work because we did not have the uh, time to do it. Plus, we didn't have the right team at that moment to put in that project. And it was, it was not good. It was not the, the, the expectation. You have to imagine, someone expected you know, the world. And we did not provide the world. We provided a good service, but not the world. And it was a complete disappointment. Um, so, so actually, it goes back to what I said. I should have said no. I should have said no from the beginning. Um, uh, and another, actually, let me add another quick one, if I may. I, I, one thing, another thing I learned is that when you say no, you say no quickly. And this goes back to your comment. You say no quickly. You don't say okay, let me think about it. I'll get back to you because you're opening yourself to now the person is thinking, oh, maybe they'll say yes. And if you actually say no two weeks later, that person's going to get, uh, there's going to be frustration in, 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 from, from the client because they could have found another person and now they have to wait for you and then now you have to say no. So you have to be decisive. You have to say no right away and actually find a solution for them. But if you say, let me think about it and I'll get back to you, you better say yes. Because if not, you're going to find yourself with a client that's going to be uh, now a, an ambassador or what I call a negative ambassador saying, oh, you know, this person. Because no one wants to accept that someone said no to them. So they're going to say, oh, I, I have to say no to them because that they, whatever. And you don't, you don't want that. I mean, the, the best thing that you can find in, uh, in, uh, in, in, your, uh, in your business is actually finding ambassadors who are willing to say great things about the, the, the uh, product that you provide. And that's why decisiveness is important. I've had clients that come up to us, actually people come up to us and, and, uh, and because we were decisive and we said no quickly, um, but we found a solution for them. They 
hired someone else for the smaller project. But when they had a chance to hire an architect for a big project, they didn't go back to the smaller architect. They came back to, um, to us. So, you know, uh, I, I, uh, in the same way that we made, we made terrible mistakes by saying yes, uh, being decisive and saying no quickly is, is uh, I would say, is more important than actually when you say yes to a client. Tell me about the course. Let's talk about the course that you are. Uh, did you come up with this course? You're teaching at the Polytechnic uh, University there in San Juan, I believe, correct? Right, in, in Puerto Rico. Yes, I, um, uh, the dean at the school came up to me maybe a couple of years ago and, and said that he was interested. Uh, he asked me if I was interested in teaching. I, I was able, when I came out of college, I taught a little bit, uh, some uh, graduate courses, and I was actually um, an assistant editor for, uh, for uh, a, a, a you know, magazine at the time called The Classicist. So I was very much involved in the academia part. But when I decided to come back to Puerto Rico, I understood that I had to refocus and I try to actually build a business. So to be honest with you, I, um, I mean, to, to, to be transparent, I didn't really want to, thought I would ever teach again. Because I felt that I didn't have the uh, patience for it. And uh, as you get a little older, uh, you know, the, um, you, you get less patient. And of course, your attention span is reduced in a matter <laughs> that, I, that I'm, I'm, I'm sure you understand. So uh, the dean of the school came up to me and said, Ricardo, uh, listen, uh, would you be interested in uh, teaching a course? And I said, well, I'd be interested if it's not design, because I'm sure you have a thousand professors who are wonderful, and I'm sure they're better than me in design. But uh, if, if you really want me to teach, I would, I would uh, consider teaching uh, a, a, a course in entrepreneurship in architecture. And he said, well, we don't have a course. And I said, well, I'll do it if I, you let me come up with it completely. And he was, uh, he was wonderful. He said, okay, I'll give you a couple of months and you come up with the uh, program. Uh, and they gave me free reign. Uh, and we uh, began their program last year and it was very successful. I can tell you that I learned from the, uh, from the students as much as I thought that I could have taught them. Uh, and and it, was a, it was a great experience. We focused on uh, many things. We focused on, on creating, um, a, you know, an understanding of what, what, what business plan they could develop, what is a vision, a mission, many of the things that we talked about today, the why, the how, uh, the importance of, of leadership, uh, the importance of branding, marketing, networking, social media, uh, public speaking. Um, you know, we we um, we do workshops. So we basically divided the first class. The first part of the class is basically a, a lecture, and then the second we divide teams in workshops. And 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 it was it has been very fulfilling for me. And I can tell you that I've learned quite a bit from it. Uh, but it, but it's um, it, it's something that I believe more and more universities should, should focus in uh, because you could be the best surgeon in the world, but if you, if you don't have a hospital, uh, you could be the best designer in the world, but you are not able to, um, you know, get out there and get work for yourself. You're going to continue, you know, doing what you and I don't like, which is actually not being on our own. And I tell everyone, I'm, I'm, listen, I, the, the, uh, the key is to become a leader. That doesn't mean that you have to own your firm, but you can be a partner in a firm. And leadership is something that I keep telling my students. It's something that you can actually learn in the same way that for years, I've, when I used to teach uh, sketching, I used to tell everyone that anyone could learn sketching. You might be a little better at it uh, or learn faster, but it's, it's, a, it's a skill that could be taught. And leadership, the same. It's a skill that can be taught. Um, so, so yes, I have to tell you that, uh, that many of the things that you and I have talked about today are, are what we have included in the, um, in, the, in the program. And it's a semester program, and we're going to go back at it uh, in uh, February next year. So. Is it going to be the same curriculum, or are you teaching a, a second version, uh, maybe an upgraded level, or is it going to be a new crop of students at the same level? It's a new crop of students, uh, but I'm tweaking uh, uh, some of the things, of course, because you learn and you want to make it better and better and better. Uh, so 
Um, one thing we did, which was, which was interesting, is that we brought in community uh, leaders from companies. We brought the president of Microsoft. We brought, we brought uh, the president of one of the biggest branding companies in the island to make sure that they looked at the networking completely outside of architects. Uh, instead of bringing another architect that talked about branding. Uh, uh, we brought experts. We brought experts in uh, inbound marketing, for example, which a lot of people don't, for some reason, don't even know. Uh, and understanding really how social media could be effective. Uh, so uh, making sure that they have a chance to not only listen to someone like me, but actually to listen to leaders in, leaders in the community, uh, from Walmart to uh, Microsoft to uh, other leaders, uh, and actually, we took them to their, co to their offices, too, so they can see also how they work. Uh, uh, so, uh, in a way, understand that if you could also become a designer one day and you actually met the, the president of Microsoft, one day you could send me an email. I was in that class. I had a chance to meet you. And, you know, we, I know you talked about process. And I'm not going to do a design for you, but we could do an analysis in processes. Oh, architects do that. And, you know, obviously you and I know that that's not talked about enough. So um, uh, I want to make sure that the next crop uh, of, of uh, kids next year get a lot more um, uh, business leaders, top 10 companies in the Caribbean, uh, YPO members, uh, leaders in, 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 uh, in business, in uh, the community, and, of course, uh, also in politics. Uh, we want to make sure that they uh, understand how it works because if you want any changes in politics, you need to be involved in it because if not, you're going to have a lot of lawyers uh, writing um, legislation for you <laughs> instead of you actually getting involved. And, I, I, you know, I tell them very, very, very uh, uh, frankly, there's a big difference between wanting to be in the ta inside a table, I mean inside, uh, sitting at the table or standing outside with, uh, with a sign. I want to be at the table. Because that's how you can make decisions. If I stand outside with a big sign, sure, you're an activist. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you want to be invited to the table instead of only you know, yelling from the outside as an activist. And, and that is where we as professionals in architecture could do a lot more. Uh, and I'm hoping that this experience with the students uh, forced them to, to see the importance of leadership outside of the realm of architecture. And when I say leadership, I want to be clear. It's not being a leader at the AIA level. It's not a leader in, in, uh, in, you know, uh, in one of the thousand uh, groups that the AIA has. That is great, and you should be involved. But it's being a leader where there are no architects. I, am, I happen to be the president of the Builders Association. I am the first president first a licensed architect in 66 years that uh, actually is the president of an uh, association that is a uh, developer's association. And, you know, you're going to wonder, why is an architect there? W why is he leading a group and he's not a developer? Well, guess what? I'm the, there's only two architects in, that, in one of the most powerful associations in Puerto Rico. Well, I, that's how you meet clients. That's how you get to know them. But if you are only sitting at the table with 10 other architects, you know, what, what, what are you, how can you really affect change if you're really talking amongst yourself? Mm. I tell people that I know that architects look down on um, the type of, types of magazines like People Magazine and uh, Us Magazine and that sort of thing uh, because they want to be in architecture and, um, you know, uh, architecture, any, any of the trade magazines. But I tell my students, remember, trade magazines are bought by architects, but not clients. Clients buy those magazines that you are looking down on because they're beneath you. So if you want to be published your work at, in People magazine, People magazine, you're going to get a lot more exposure than just because you were published in architecture magazine. Trust me on that. Oh, but that's beneath, beneath me. Why? Why is your work, you know, beneath uh, being seen by everyone? I, I don't understand. So we have to, in a way, I'm trying to force my class to get outside of themselves and over themselves too, with their own, you know, uh, a vision of, 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 of the profession. Because if not, our profession is going to die.
and not because the architecture is going to die, is the business model of architecture, which is actually semi-dead. And, we, that, uh, and I, that's what I'm trying to preach in that class. Make sure you guys get outside of the comfort zone and become relevant. And sadly, architecture has become irrelevant. And I have to tell you, yes, you could talk, you could talk about art, star architects everywhere. Well, star architects represent the 0.0001% of our profession. And if you only look up to star architecture, which in general tends to be exactly the opposite of what I told you about you know, selfishness, because they hire you because they want you. They don't hire you because they want their vision being enabled by you. So what kind of world are we going to have? We're going to have a world of architecture only focused on the wow factor. And I, I'm telling you, I, I'm not fo I'm, we, our firm is not focused on the wow factor. We're focused on creating a place of purpose. And the purpose has to be beyond themselves as architects. So uh, I, uh, my, uh, what I preach is let's get outside of ourselves and let's make sure we position each and every one of us in areas that we don't feel comfortable with. And by the way, what I mean, what I mean is not becoming a socialite. If you want to become a socialite to get work, fantastic. But not all of us are interested in that. I am a happily married man. I have three wonderful daughters. And I, at 6 o'clock, I don't want to hang out with anyone. I want to go home and spend time with my kids. I love my kids. So if you think that if you don't go to that gala or party, you're not going to get work, well, you have to do something else. So put yourself in a position of leadership outside your realm. Because if you don't hang, hang out with, uh, a, a, in, as a socialite, and you don't, I, don't I don't drink, so that makes it a little harder. <laughs> so, you know, there's, other, there's many other ways you could do it without having to force yourself to become something you're not. And, uh, and going back to, this, to our, uh, who you are and your vision and mission, your vision has to be a vision of yourself. Because nowadays, if you're not transparent and you're not um, honest of who you are, people can read that a mile away. I could tell millennials could smell a mile away if your business is not necessarily what you preach. If you talk about being sustainable, but you're not sustainable, people could see that a mile away. So you have to be true to yourself. And if what makes you happy is X, Y, and Z, and you go through that a process of the introspection that I talked to you about, fantastic. Be true to yourself. Don't try to be something else. And then you're going to be very successful within that realm that you choose to become part of. And at the same time, you have to take yourself out of that realm and then educate other people about our profession instead of actually sitting in the table with every single architect that you know. So I, one thing I can tell you is that, that I've learned is that uh, when, you have, when you see people you know, in, in opposition, oh, I don't, that guy I don't like because he's a terrible businessman, or someone would say, well, that's, that's, uh, I, I, he, he or she are horrible human beings. Have you ever had a chance to meet those people? Because in my experience, when you actually have those same people sitting at the same table, they don't talk to each other the same way they do through Twitter, <laughs> through uh, Facebook, Facebook. So you have to be in that table. So instead of judging that horrible developer that is destroying the world, why don't you get in that table? Help that developer do a much better job instead of actually just standing outside criticizing that developer. Ricardo, you said that you th you you said that the business uh, the business model of architecture is semi dead. Could you clarify what you mean by that? Well, the business model model that you and I were taught in college is uh, basically you you uh, you are a very good designer. Uh, you focus in design. Uh, and then uh, people will flock to you. That is it. That is the only business model we, are, we were ever taught. And as a matter of fact, it's interesting because that business model also focused on little things like inefficiency. You, were, you actually thought of yourself as a better student or architect if you spend more hours without sleeping. What is that? I mean, <laughs> explain that to me. It was a badge of honor if you told the world, I haven't slept for 72 straight hours to finish this project. You know what I tell those people? You are inefficient and you have no idea how to manage. So we actually 
um, the the model is is actually uh, you know uh, applauding inefficiency. It's applauding um, not having any business skill whatsoever because they will find you. And I tell you, my father told me a long time a long time ago that in life you never get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. So you need to negotiate that client because that client is not going to come to you just because you're fantastic. And that is the business of architecture we see. That's why we've been so unsuccessful for so many years. That's why I find it amazing that the top 300 firms in the U.S., you have Gensler invoicing a billion dollars a year, but the number 300 invoices 7 million a year. 85% of all the firms in the U.S. are small firms, mm. tiny firms, which are struggling with three to four people every single day. Why are we struggling so much? How come we, and there's a, actually a wonderful article that came out a couple, of, maybe months ago, that analyzed the amount of hours architects spend, I mean, actually the amount of hours as a student people spend, and architecture spends 21 hours a week in, 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 in architecture. And the second most spend 18 hours. By the way, not even doctors are close to that 21. So what are you teaching our kids? We're teaching the business model of inefficiency, of uh, waiting and see, not being leaders, but being followers because the client follows me. I mean, the, the client knocks the door and gets me instead of me being out there and actually creating a project. And then I find the client for that project that I'm creating. Uh, and that's what I mean. I mean that that is the business model that if we continue in that path, it's, it's absolutely dead. And architecture will be dead by then if we don't do anything about it. Well, thank you, Ricardo. It's been a very invigorating conversation. <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I, I know I digressed a little bit in some areas, but I get very passionate. Uh, and I know that uh, with people like you leading the charge in, uh, in the business of architecture, and entrepreneurship, uh, you're going to continue to educate many people and hopefully make sure that the next crop of students that are coming out of college, they understand the importance of business development and, and uh, entrepreneurship in our, in our profession. So thank you so much for what you're doing. I appreciate it. It is my pleasure, Ricardo. Thank you for being on the show. Now, th another question did come to mind. I'm going to throw this yeah. out here at you. And the question is, is there one question that I should have asked that I didn't, that you wish that I would have asked? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Um, hmm, wow, you did, a, you did a good job asking me something I can't ask uh, and ask myself. I, I think, hmm, I have to think about that one. I, I would, okay, uh, how, how about if I ask myself? Are you ready? Okay. Um, what do you tell a student that doesn't know if he or she should go into architecture just because they keep telling them that there's no money in architecture? And the answer to, uh, to, uh, to that question is, if you focus only in money, You'll be, you'll be unsuccessful in anything you do. But I can tell you for sure that if you follow a entrepreneurship mentality in the business of architecture, you're going to be not only successful, you're going to make everyone else successful around you. And, I, and I'm going to tell you one thing that has happened to me. I, um, I, was in, um, I went to high school. They invited me to talk about architects. And some of the students were saying, I'm not sure if I want to go into architecture because they tell me that in Puerto Rico, there's no work, there's no jobs, and that you have to work really hard and there's not really you know, that much money there. And, I, and the first thing I asked them is that, okay, so what is holding you back? In, if you want to study a profession, you're saying that it's holding you back the fact that in this small little island, there's no work. Why don't you go someplace else? You can go anywhere in the world and be a professional. Oh, but I want to come back here. Sure, I did too. I worked 
wherever I wanted to work, and then I decided to come back. So thinking globally, and this is a topic that you and I didn't touch upon today, thinking globally is the only way you could absolutely be successful in any region that you choose to practice architecture. Who would have thought that a guy from Puerto Rico is actually doing a project in the Middle East? Why? Because if you don't think big and you are actually afraid of making those decisions, you're going to fail. And all those questions you get when you are in high school or even in college come out of a place of fear. And I can tell that, um, actually Machiavelli said something interesting. He said, the opposite of love is not hate, it's fear. And if you're afraid of making decisions, you're never going to be able to make any right decision. If you're afraid of telling someone you love them because you're afraid that that person is not going to love you back, you're never going to know what true love is. If you're afraid of asking that girl out on a date because she might say no, well, you will never know because she could have said yes. If you're afraid of saying no to a client because you think you're not going to get a job later, you're going to make a bad decision that might affect you later. And in my experience, if you are not able to, say, to actually take those fears away, you're not going to be successful in anything. Forget business. In your own marriage, in your relationship with your kids, you cannot be successful if you don't allow yourself to have that fear and put that in a corner. If you're afraid of telling your kids you love them because, you're, because they're going to leave when they're 18 and you won't see them again, they're going to they're gonna go and they won't see you again. You have to tell them you love them. So I, um, my, 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 my recommendation is do whatever you, it, it takes to try to put away that fear and, and things will work out. I can tell you that if there's a recommendation I could give people, choose wisely who you spend time with, not only in your personal life, but also in your business life. And actually mathematics does it well for us. If, if you have a positive and a negative, what do you have? A negative. You need two positives and a negative in order to actually have a positive. So that tells you that when you're around toxic people telling you every single day, meaning architects that you sit with and life sucks, there's no work, there's nothing to do, I don't even know. Well, everything's going to be terrible. But if you focus on around people that actually uplift you instead of bring you down, you're going to be absolutely successful. So going back to the question that you asked me, I would ask myself, what do you tell someone when they say, I don't know if I want to be an architect because there's no money. I don't know if I want to do this because I think I make sure that those questions don't come from a place of uh, fear. If they do, you're not going to be successful. Awesome. Ricardo, thank you for joining me today on the Business of Architecture. It's been an awesome conversation. Well, uh, I, I appreciate it. And, okay, and thank you for taking the time. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, get access to my free four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. You can also get it by texting the phrase profit map, that's two words, to the phone number 773-770-4377. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects and design professionals. Get rid of the post-it notes and Excel spreadsheets and get real-time insights on the profitability of your firm with a simple, beautiful, and easy-to-customize graphical dashboard. Say goodbye to undercharging or ending the year wondering where all that profit went. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm. Learn more and get a free trial over at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.